I've just ridden home on this box fresh 88 Ridgeback 602. And if you've seen my emotional love letter to this bike, I'll leave a link below, you will know that there will never be a bike that better embodies my nostalgia for lost youth. For which reason I will never need another 80s mountain bike. Jokes, what do you think's in this box? Now anyone who saw my world's cleanest Muddy Fox unboxing video will know that Simon, the gentleman who sent it, did such a beautiful job of packaging it that slitting it open is almost sacrilegious, but slit it open we must. I know that it's going to be something very special. Dior wheels from what looks like the mid 80s. And as for the frame, it is a Saracen Trekker. Now that is exciting. Now an absolute must for followers of this channel um, is the video which I will also link below in which during lockdown I slunk out to pick up uh, a slightly later Saracen Trekker um, in the dead of night for about 30 quid off Facebook. And it ended up being one of the best builds I've ever done. In fact, a bike that I truly love and I'm very proud of. This is a slightly earlier one. Uh, you can tell uh, it's also slightly higher spec that the limited edition tracker that I built for my mate Paul was spec with an X-Age group set. This came as standard with Dior, which is a higher level of uh, equipment. Uh, it's the same Tangay MTB tubing, but you can tell from the graphics and I'm sure the frame number will prove this is mid eighties rather than late eighties. Now, like a spoilt child at Christmas, I'm going in. Uh, like everything I've previously acquired from this particular cartel associate, I can attest that his packaging is assiduous to say the least. And this is no exception. Very nice, original seat post. This looks like a screw on freewheel. Predates hyperglide, superglide, any kind of glide. These are just square teeth. So the shifting is going to be uh, an experience. Rear mech, always a component to get excited about, at least if you're me. Oh, it's a beauty. Now look at that. Obviously, this isn't the earliest uh, of its kind. Of course, the mountain bike group set was called Deerhead before its name was um, changed to Dior and Dior XT, but this is still a very early incarnation of Dior, certainly predates LXDX, etc. Um, a very desirable piece of kit there. So I'm hoping that these are original Dior to complement the groups there. Oh, they are, they are, look at that. Reach adjust, proper four finger motocross style brake levers. No messing about there. Lovely. Those will clean up beautifully. Oh, there's an original bottle cage. That's nice. It matches the frame and so does the stem. Very similar to the one on the 88 Ridgeback. Lovely. Here's something I got excited about on the other Saracen Trekker and indeed on a lot of my 80s projects, a U-brake. Don't tell me this is, it is, it's U-brakes front and rear. I don't think I've ever owned a bike with a U-brake up front. The Ridgeback, as with so many bikes in the later 80s, has a rear U-brake under the chainstay, which we've talked about being a, uh, a rather strange thing here in the UK where mud collects down there. Um, but having them on the front, it's kind of more of a BMX thing to me, but that is one of a pair of U-brakes which I'm very excited to set up. Lovely, original Dior front mech, all rusty and chewed up, which is just how I like them. Ripe for restoration. Oh, I'd forgotten about shifters. Brilliant. Six speed Dior thumb shifters. Very well battered, but intact. Always a delight to clean up and service old thumb shifters. Another video that viewers of this channel will be familiar with. Six speed, clickety click. You can see from the steerer that won't have seen daylight what color it is meant to be, a nice deep cherry red versus the 
really sun faded, almost pinkish hue that it's taken on over the years, um, which is great. I take that as a challenge because I think with a bit of color restorer, some teeth cuts and polish, we can bring out this lovely red and restore the bike back to its original finish rather than having to do any repainting, which regular viewers will know I hate. Surprisingly light handlebar. Lighter, I may add, than, ah, a higher spec than the one on my mate Paul's Trekker. Sorry, Paul. This one is etched ITM, Itel Manubri. That's a very high-end handlebar compared to, I guess, the, the standard Saracen branded ones. This will be a treat. I imagine this predates by a pace. Oh, look at that. Okay, well I was wrong. That is a biopace, but it must be one of the earliest incarnations. Oh, and it's lovely. It's even got the little original chrome cap. Merry Christmas to me. Now, before I commence the cleanup, I need to do some shopping, which thankfully is one of my favorite hobbies. Um, first of all, I'm gonna need to replace at least, well, I'd say not just this one spoke. It looks like others are going to go the way that this one has, which is fine. I like a bit of wheel building. Secondly, you'll note from this pile that the original pedals have long gone. I think uh, obviously the bike predates SPDs. Um, finding some original Dior platforms will be a challenge, but something I will relish. And also, um, it doesn't have a saddle. That's long gone too. Okay, the quest for pedals has been an easy one. Um, I asked myself one simple question, which is, if I was rich enough to have a Saracen Trekker in the 80s and the Dior pedals had gone missing, what would I have done? Simple answer is, I'd have upgraded to XT. <laughs> Here's a process of which I will never tire. If you subscribe to this channel, you'll know what's coming next. All right, that's the soapy bath done. Um, when you look close up, there are definitely some corroded steel bits, uh, not least things like the pinch bolts on these shifters that uh, definitely need a night in the vinegar, which is lucky because I've got plenty. Right, now for the red bits, which are actually currently more like pink. The challenge right now is to restore this to this, which in the 1987 Saracen catalogue is called Guards Red. Incidentally, that's exactly the same colour as the famous Porsche 911 Turbo of the same era. I've never driven one of those, but one day I will and make a video on that. It's become apparent that despite this uh, color fast product which is actually quite good um this guards red is going to remain largely guards pink i guess there's just no way you can put color back on when over decades it's been taken off however um a nice shiny marble pink is not a bad thing and uh, as you will know i prefer patinated originality to any kind of respray not least because i'm lazy so i'm still going to polish this and uh, i still think it's going to look great You can see in places like where the front neck band was clamped on it throughout its life, 
what the colour should look like and what it's now going to look like. That doesn't actually bother me because it's cleaned up beautifully, it's nice and shiny, and most importantly, it looks authentically every one of its many years. Twenty four hours later. Wheel has proved to be easier than I thought. First of all, it came up gleaming with the muck off. Secondly, I had plenty of spare spoke, so I've replaced the one that was snapped and labelled it so that I can true the wheel when the um, bearings and axles are back in. Uh, and thirdly, what I thought was a screw-on freewheel was in fact a free hub, much like the later ones, which I'm very familiar with, that uh, attaches with a 10mm Allen key uh, with a six-speed cassette already attached to it. Again, immaculately clean. So this thing's ready to roll. Thanks to the brilliant website retrobike.co.uk, I have access to the original 1987 Saracen catalogue. Um, and here is the Trekker in Guards Red. Now, there are a few things to note when looking at this catalogue. First of all, um, as most viewers will know, by the late 90s, Saracen was a mass market manufacturer with little to interest the connoisseur. But don't forget, in 87, Saracen was not playing games. The fact is, back then, mountain biking was a fringe, extreme sport. The only people that had mountain bikes were either the dedicated or the wealthy. So Saracen's range of real mountain bikes, as illustrated by their assault on Kilimanjaro, were serious kit. There were only four bikes in the range, the Conquest being the ultimate. The Trekker is actually the second from bottom of the range, uh, with Tough Tracks being the entry level. But all four of these bikes were really special. Um, well, looking at the spec list, mine is almost entirely complete, except for a few XT upgrades, such as the pedals, chain set. Quick word on my improvised homemade headset press. Um, I've got a Park Tool one, and I actually prefer this for one simple reason. The threaded rod I've made it from extends all the way down to the ground where it forms a leg that basically gives you a bit of extra stability so that you can fit headset cups um, with a lot less faff. Behold. There you go, no less fine tuning required than a professional tool, but you just tighten and move, tighten and move, making use of the stability of this monopod on the ground uh, until you don't see daylight between the cups and the frame. And as you can see, that is military precision. Similarly satisfying putting this bottom bracket back together. Uh, it's seen some action in its 35 years, but just look at the finish and the action on it. It's, uh, it's immaculate. Just a beautiful bit of kit. And also, when was the last time you got to use the combo of these two?
One of the things that used to gnaw away at me as a kid in the 80s with my Ridgeback was the fact that the X-Age trail hubs had these solid axles, i.e. they were nutted on with a spanner. They were not compatible with quick-release skewers, despite the pictures in the catalogues. Of course, Dior and above, uh, Dior and XT, had hollow axles. However, from 1987, which is where this wheel dates back to, clearly this Dior came with a solid axle. Now, at the time, I would have done anything to upgrade had I had the skills and the equipment and the funds. But now I'm inclined not to. I'm inclined to stick with originality, stick with the solid axle that it came with. This must have been the last year that Dior hubs came with nutted axles. But it runs beautifully, so why mess with it? I am the undisputed king of wheel building, um, but I'm not going to win any trophies for this aberration. Um, for an invisible reason, the spokes are all two millimeter straight gauge and the one I replaced is double butted, which tapers down to a 1.8 mil. You can't see it with the naked eye, but you and I now know it's there. So whilst this bike is going to look great on YouTube and it's going to win all the plaudits on social media, um, we, the inner circle, know the sordid truth. Anyone seen a Panaracer smoke? Uh, that was the dominant tyre of the early 90s, but for the 80s, well, this looks like a prototype for that very tyre. This, by the way, isn't dirt. This is rubber residue. These tyres have never been used. And I think just judging by the design on them, these are Vittorias, by the way, free climb number eight. Um, I think judging just by the way they're made and the, the lettering and so on, these are probably period correct. Anyway, never used, nice tread, nice and fat. I can't fault them, on they go. This is a nice bit of trivia I've spotted. It's such an early version of reach adjust that they've yet to work out how to even spell the word adjust in English. So uh, that suggests to me that this is the first generation of the technology. By the way, I have full size hands, so I won't be using the reach adjust. These first generation Shimano U-brakes are not without their quirks. The spring setup's not difficult, but if you've got a particularly a wide rim like I've got here, fitting the pads is a nightmare. Uh, these are brand new U-brake specific pads, but because they're non Shimano, they actually don't fit. They don't hit the rim square and there's not enough post. These retaining nuts are barely held on. Thank God I've got a stash because these things don't come up on eBay very often. I actually looked in my brake box and here are some original 80s U-brake blocks, which I'm very lucky to have. I'm conscious that this video has been rather light on pro tips, but I'm hoping this little nugget makes up for it. Um, these chain gauges are absolutely essential and when the gauge shows that your chain has worn past 0.75 percent you're going to want to launch the thing straight in the bin because if you leave it on your bike it's going to start chewing up the teeth on your chain rings and cassette and cause a much more expensive repair so before you chuck the chain away my tip is this it starts with a little nail or hook either in the ceiling or door frame of your workshop and basically you hang your old chain from it 
hang your new chain next to your old chain on the same hook and then follow them both down and where the old chain ends that's the exact link on the new chain that you need to remove in order for it to be the right length. Foam grips and contrasting cable outers. It is after all the 80s, but it doesn't just look amazing. Look at this, this is slick. Now for perhaps the most important finishing touch, the saddle upgrade. Um, I fully endorse the opinion of the Marin man who says that the wrong saddle on a collectible bike deserves nothing less than a bonfire. He is of course correct, but that doesn't help me find the right saddle. Um, I'd love to hear what you would do if this was uh, your build. Um, there are so many options. First, of course, you can see from the catalogue that this thing originally came specced with a non-leather Madison saddle, which of course would have been chucked away by its first owner because those things were okay, but certainly not collectible, and you don't expect them to stick around to this day. You can see here in the 88 Ridgeback catalogue, the one that also long gone, my Ridgeback originally came with. I replaced that with a Rolls, but we'll come to that later. Um, the Saracen own brand saddles didn't come out until the following year. You can see the one on my Make Paul's bike, which is beautiful, but wouldn't work on this trekker. Brooks is a brand that was um, very sought after and very high end back in the 80s, but it was considered too old school for the futuristic sport of mountain biking. So you would never see a Brooks saddle on a mountain bike. The next thing I considered was an Avocet. Um, but then I scratched that itch with my Ridgeback by putting one on that as, a, as an upgrade. The fact is it's a Californian brand and this is a very British build, so it's not gonna work. We've disregarded flights um, for the basis that they didn't come out until about three years after this bike was built. Um, and I had the same thought about Vettas. Veta were very popular on high-end rallies at the time. I've got a couple, one came on a Dynatech and one that's on this Peugeot, but for the same reason as the flight, not appropriate for the Saracen. Um, that brings us to the rolls. Um, like I said, the, the one that I put on my ridge back, back in the day, in retrospect, was probably too ornate for an otherwise utilitarian build. And the two that I've got are both red with gold bits, which is just not right for the, the look of this bike. Which then finally leads us to what's perhaps the obvious conclusion and would have been as the first choice upgrade for a rider in 87, which as of course Gary's project has worked out a long time ago, is the classic turbo. Um, and the one you can see here on my rally is in fact a tan new buck one, which isn't gonna look right on the Saracen, not to mention the fact that it looks perfect where it is on the rally. So what that leads us to is a black one. There it is. One final word on this beauty. I just weighed it and it was 14 kilos, more than 14 kilos. That's more than 31 pounds in gammon units. But the fact is in 1987, mountain bikers were not looking for titanium and carbon. They wanted something indestructible that you could strap your luggage to and cross a continent. And this thing, as it stands, is ready to go.